Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, please tell me your name and your affiliation. So I'm James Haft. I'm the executive chairman of DLTX, which is a listed company in Norway on the Norwegian big, big board. Uh, so DLTX.ol is our symbol. Uh, we're the first company that listed publicly, which represents a portfolio of assets in the distributed ledger technology space. So the public markets have been wary of uh, blockchain and, and distributed ledger technologies. Um, why Norway and what was the reaction? Um, so just to give it some context, uh, for the last 30 years I've focused on emerging markets and creating access for investors to opportunities that otherwise represent new asset classes and really all, in the beginning start as alternative investments and then become mainstream. And uh, over 30 years, I've worked in China, in Russia, in Latin America with major investment banks, where I've started to develop the methodology for how international, how international investors participate in these blue ocean opportunities. And in 1996, I realized that while I loved working in the emerging markets, the physical markets like China, where I ran corporate finance for Bear Stearns and listed the first company in China to list on the New York Stock Exchange, um, I realized in 1996 that a bigger opportunity was in front of me, uh, and that was to look at the digitization of information and the impact it was going to have on businesses, on humanity, on religion, on society, on the economy, uh, really how it's going to rip through our whole lives, uh, very much like Andreessen said, uh, you know, software is going to eat the world. And I thought digitization of information is going to eat the world, it's going to change us, it's going to enable new methodologies of communication, new methodologies of forming consensus. Uh, and new ways to address the obvious issues that humanity has been having for the last three decades, which are now becoming so much so present and boiling to the surface that you can no longer ignore them. Where, but they've been there for, for 20, 30 years as, as concepts that have been boiling up and you know, tampering, being tampered down by people who want to keep the system the way it is. And so I looked at emerging markets and I realized that there were patterns. And there was a lot of a academic work done on these patterns. Uh, uh, on how the markets develop. And the markets tend to develop in a really interesting way where you have one asset, a company or a person who jumps up and gets all the mind share and gets way overbought. And then people realize it's overbought in your head and it collapses. And then two or three people come in because it's a movement, it's not, a, it's not an individual, and two or three companies come in. So Bitcoin, Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? And, then, and they crash again because they get overbought and everyone gets ahead of themselves and, oh my God, this is never going to work and the government's going to make outlaw it. But it's the same for China. We're going to outlaw China. We can't do business with China. They're communist. You know, all these things that happen. Russia, you know, never do business with Russia. It's a, all these things are the same patterns and fractals. And, so, and then after the second collapse, then you go back up again and all of a sudden each step is higher and higher with more and more companies involved and all of a sudden a community starts to form. And there's several companies, and there's several investors, and there's several markets. And then that starts to build and get regularized and then turns into a normalized market over time with different, in different time frames, but time frames that are becoming compressed more and more because of the way humanity has learned to communicate better uh, and, and have tighter communication infrastructure over time. And so um, I realized that the emerging market that I want to focus on was the digitization of information. Uh, and so in 1996, I formed a company just to, to, for, to advise and work with those companies. And I've been lucky. Uh, you know, a lot of people told me that I was wrong, that, you know, that what do you mean a business to, to support businesses that digitize information? That's not a business, right? And now people say to me, what are you talking about? That's every business, mm -hmm. right? And so being early looks a lot like being wrong. Uh, you take a lot of, you know, arrows in your back uh, while you're trying to run through. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, I think you know that I we called it well, and I stuck with that concept and was able to uh, move over towards um, the uh, blockchain and distributed ledger world in 2015 when I started to understand Bitcoin and I started to understand smart contracts through Ethereum. I started to realize that that we really were getting to that point that I've been waiting for for 20 years. Um, a lot of my thought is influenced by um, science fiction. Uh, and anyone that knows me well knows it's hard to have a conversation without my mentioning Neil Stevenson, uh, who I believe has seen all this coming uh, for 30 years, uh, specifically a book called Snow Crash, uh, where he predicted metaverses where we have algorithmic-driven avatars that, that uh, perform several parts of our lives, 
simultaneously so that we can, as humans, break the time and space continuum uh, and, you know, and start to actually be in several places at once and be transacting in several ways at simultaneously uh, and really get to a concept of abundance you know, over exclusion. Uh, and where you really can't, are no longer limited by time, which is the one limit that all humans have right now. Uh, tell me more about uh, DLTX. Uh, what is the business model? What are the various components, uh, at least today? So, going in line with the concept that, uh, that we have avatars and, and that these digital um, organisms are really in lot people just the way corporations are people. Right? So cor corporations are not people, but under the law, they're people, right? When you get beyond the law and you get really to what's happening in the world right now, these DAOs, these platforms, these protocols that are, that are, that are existent, they, they behave in a predictable, algorithmically driven manner. And so we at DLTX look at the ways that the protocols are built and the, way, and, the re, and, and the actions that they will do given our inputs to those systems. And then we build financial opportunities based on the predictability of those interactions. So it's very much like when you're playing bridge and the dummy hand comes out. Now the dummy hand's there, it's published for everyone. It's an open ledger, right? Mm -hmm. And then I sit there as, as my partner being the dummy and I can now programmatically play against that hand against my two opponents. So what we do is we find protocols that we believe are significant um, impact, will have significant impact on the world and that will have legs over time and have hundreds of millions of users and represent important uh, uh, players in, in the global economy and society. For instance, Filecoin, which we believe uh, it will be very significant basically as the Bitcoin for distributed file storage. Mm -hmm. We believe that uh, censorship proof file storage is going to end up becoming a core need and right of humanity and of corporations, and that Filecoin is most likely the one that's going to provide that platform. Uh, and then we look for platform, platforms where their token value um, has preceded the true value of where the network is at that moment in time. So what happens is Filecoin comes out, everyone gets excited, it goes to five billion, they don't have enough nodes to support five billion, they don't have enough business, they don't have, people even know who they are but the people in the know are willing to bet forward. And now Filecoin has an interesting dilemma. They have $5 billion market cap, they have a, a foundation with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in it, but they don't really have the network that represents the reality of where they need to be. And they are essentially now in a race, and this happens vertical by vertical, it's not just Filecoin, I'm just using them as an example, but they're in a race now to fill out their, their, uh, their nodes on their network, and so to be robust, to be well known, to be used, and to be habituated into people's activities, uh, and they're in a race. They're against, uh, and so, what they do is that is the protocols build themselves uh, or are programmed so that um, they overcompensate early participants who are willing to take the financial risk and have the technological savvy to build on their network to contribute computing power and to generate the base token uh, in 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 um, as a reward for building out the network for the protocol, because the protocol doesn't even exist, it has no arms and legs, it, there's, there's, there's no human there. Uh, and so it needs to incentivize the activities of others to build itself out. And so during that phase, they, the, the, these protocols, and uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin is the same thing, with you know, early paid out a lot more Bitcoin for a transaction, and it's happening every four years, and we're being reduced through difficulty. Uh, right now, Filecoin is, in the, is in one of the, and a lot of other uh, protocols are in this point where they're overcompensating. So we put together arbitrage opportunities where we, we intermediate between the capital markets and investors and the protocol and the development of the protocol's nodes and capabilities and receive back a, a, a remuneration from the protocol for the activity, which when compared to classic returns in the capital markets uh, are huge. Uh, it, you uh, described the network and how it needs uh, support. Um, in order for your arbitrage to complete, uh, does that mean that you need to operate network nodes as well? Yes, we are not a fund, uh, and we are not, uh, we, we, and we're not, you know, private equity. Um, we are an operating, a technology operating company. We have uh, significant people, uh, real estate, 
um, and machinery, uh, which is in the business of 24-7 you know, generating cycles which produce tokens uh, where we believe that the value of that token is at least 10 times the cost of what it costs for us to produce it. Um, do you think that uh, uh, there is value in, in a vertical integration where uh, the, the Filecoin protocol, which you support through operating the nodes, uh, will uh, develop uh, slowly but surely um, second and third layer applications on top uh, where you could also play uh, a role or uh, uh, the opposite strategy where you will take the existing infrastructure that you built and you provide uh, the, the network capacity to other protocols instead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I'm not smart enough to know the future that well. Mm -hmm. um, that certainly we need to make sure that the protocol is used. Otherwise, we'll be sitting with a lot of empty computing power and storage. Uh, it's already being used, it's already being adopted faster uh, than expected. Um, however, um, it's a very lucrative business to be actually running, the, to be competing with AWS mm -hmm. as opposed to just generating the tokens. Mm -hmm. And it's a different, distinctly different business to generate the tokens and build the network than it is to market storage to corporations. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and so I'm a decentralist and I'm a volunteerist, according to my partner David Johnston. Uh, so volunteerist means I believe that you build systems that people volunteer into and can volunteer out. So you don't build, you, you, you work with the carrot, not the stick. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you build something that's so attractive that people want to come in. It's robust, it's accessible, it's inexpensive, it's, it's reliable, you know, and, and, that, and that attracts people. The truth is once people are on your network storing data, it's almost impossible for them to leave because they start to depend upon it. Think about your Dropbox or your G Drive. When's the last time you took something out of those things? And when's, when's the last time you even considered not paying the bill? So it's a very sticky activity. Um, uh, so, right now, I would rather see a world where we just generate and where third parties build those layers and we build, and, and there's hooks that other people build to serve themselves. I would rather see that demand pull. I believe that's the definition of a more healthy uh, um, community in the, in the new capitalist environment that's presented by, by the blockchain world. Um, having said that, we may open a division to market the data or partner with people specifically to, mar to market the data. Uh, but I would do that in a way where we compete openly, uh, you know, and where we actually help, you know, in, in, in a co-opetition kind of model, uh, where the idea is to make sure that we have the success of the community rather than to pulverize, you know, the, in a military fashion, in the old style uh, of how you go after your competitors. We would rather be part of a, of a, of a, of a, of a community that's providing these services uh, and has like mind. Uh, as a decentralist and a voluntarist, uh, is there a contradiction in you uh, uh, being uh, at the helms of a public company which is completely centralized or it is a stepping stone in a direction that is more consistent with your views? So I revel in the cognitive dissonance of that concept. Uh, there is no question that there are uh, um, logical, psychological and philosophical uh, conflicts that we could talk about in that aspect. Um, in a perfect world, you know, I think we would spin up as DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, and that we would have beautifully democratic and fair and balanced cons cons consensus methodologies, and the will of the people would be pure and represented by, you know, by these, by these um, pristine organizations. However, we don't live there. Uh, and we live in a place where there is history and there is legacy and there is stickiness and there is friction and there are doubters. Uh, and, uh, and so th there's a transition period. Uh, nobody really likes how the, to see how the sausage gets made, but you probably like eating it, right? And so I look at us as being part of the transition. I look at us as being early uh, and the tip of the spear to try and experiment with how we can use these new technologies to serve the needs of the people. The needs of the people don't change. The technology changes, the politics change, what we learn about science changes, right? But the people stay the same. People need the same thing now that they needed 3,000, 5,000 years ago. You know, Maslow's pyramid hasn't changed since he invented it. Um, and so um, I believe that there's benefit in moving towards a less legalistic society 
where math replaces law, uh, because math is law. Um, and that where we can go, if we can, if we can get to a point where, where we're based upon algorithms and algorithmic certainty, uh, it means that we can share information openly without questioning each other uh, and without need, we, we can have truth without trusting. I don't need to do all the things the government does to quantify and certify and, and you know, ratify transactions because in a world where everything's open and an open ledger, you're able to actually determine to protect yourself easier. Um, as, a, as a public company uh, based on digital ledger technologies, there are a lot of opportunities of what is called the dot fooding. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know what uh, the um, regulator uh, in the Nordic uh, stock market uh, uh, is open to and what uh, your dialogue with them uh, potentially is, but uh, you know, the traditional uh, uh, function of auditing and quarterly reports and, and shareholder communications, uh, investor uh, voting rights, uh, and, and a very large number of uh, functions can be actually upgraded uh, with, with uh, uh, blockchain technologies. Have you had a dialogue uh, with, the, with the local uh, regulators about not, any of this? Not yet. Uh, we're a young company. We, we only uh, took control of, of this entity in April of this year, so six months. Um, and um, that opportunity is there, but there are people who are afraid. And, you know, and the regulators uh, don't want to make mistakes, so they'd rather move in incremental, marginal fashion. Um, I hope that we're part of a healthy dialogue. We uh, respect the laws of Norway. Uh, we want to be the model citizen uh, in the Norwegian system for both the regulators and our shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'd like to be an agent of change to evolution rather than revolution. We don't need to change everything overnight, but if there's ways that we could digitize and create better systems which are more open, which are more fair, um, I think that Norway will be open to that. Norway is a very interesting society of egalitarianism and uh, openness and uh, really a sense of, of, of a, fam a country as a family. Uh, and I think that we fit in. I think that, that our, the founders that came in together uh, to merge with the company in Norway that we acquired, I think we all share that idea of family and of responsibility to, to, you know, to the collective. Uh, and the question is, who is the collective? Is it your... Is it your, is it your wife, is it your family, is it your extended family, is it your city, is it your country, is it your, you know, is it, or is it the world, yeah. right, and, or is it the universe? And so you really need to figure out who that collective is and, and, and how you do it. Everybody serves somebody, right? Um, and so we look forward to being part of that dialogue. We have not yet really opened it up, uh, and we're trying very hard to make ourselves look like every other public company from the outside looking in. We, we are audited. Uh, we file our reports, we, are, we have full transparency. We actually would like to have more transparency than I think is normal for a public company because that's what we believe in, radical transparency. Um, uh, but you need to do it within the guidelines and, you know, and then try to improve the guidelines uh, to bring up you know, the, the level of the water with everybody together. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful Thank conversation you. and good luck with your next Thank steps. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.